Conferencing. I hope that uh, the DUP's much vaunted improvements in rural broadband are already making things better for you already. Didn't need to be. <laughs> <laughs> Very tactful yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say as well. But no, no, no. <laughs> too early for that. Okay. Uh, if we are content to proceed through the agenda, uh, first of all, apologies. We have no apologies. Uh, Chair, just uh, I'd like to apologise that uh, I will have to leave the meeting at the very latest at four o'clock. At six o'clock. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, ask the clerk of the notice. Any member is de have you delegated authority for any votes? I don't <coughs> think there are any. Members, but has, have you delegated authority for any votes? Yes. Philip, Philip, are you yep. happy and content to take this vote? Yep. Yep. Thank you. Uh, declarations of interest. Uh, I'm declaring an interest. Uh, there's an amendment to the bill, uh, Jim Allister's bill, that uh, I'm a co-signature uh, co uh, on, that is coming through as part of business today. Uh, I am indeed a ratepayer, as most of all of us, because we've got LPS in front of us. And I'm also, as you're aware, I have raised an issue with the Commissioner of Standards about a member of this committee. That's my interest. Any other? Person wants to make a declaration of interest. I am also a repair. Well, yeah, just a, uh, with regards to the issues around the building uh, regulations, the fire combustible stuff that uh, care that my son works for, uh, one of the companies involved that we're engaging with. Okay. <coughs> my standing declaration about my bill. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, if we move on to the draft minutes proceedings of the 11th of November, uh, inform members the draft minutes are at page six. Are we content with the draft minutes or an accurate record of proceedings? Content. Are we agreed the minutes will be published on the website? Agreed. Uh, matters arising. Uh, amendment to the building regulations, Northern Ireland 2012, expert witnesses. Uh, responses have been received from the following potential witnesses confirming they are unable to attend the oral evidence session scheduled for the 25th of November. That's Professor Chris Johnson, Alan Mayers, uh, Professor Luke Bisbee, and uh, Dr. Barbara Lane. Um, this is due because, obviously, with the Grenville inquiry still ongoing, and obviously there are issues here with them being seen to be giving evidence here, whilst the Grenville uh, inquiry is continuing. Uh, Dr. Lane provided a number of additional witnesses who are not involved in the Grenville inquiry, who she suggested the committee wish to consider at page four. Uh, the committee was asked by email on the 16th of November for agreement to approach these potential witnesses, and the following members agreed Paul, Gemma, Philip, uh, Jim, and Pat. Uh, for the purpose of recording the evidence to approach witnesses and ask to be able to give evidence on the 25th, uh, I would just like to inform you that uh, the following witnesses are, on, are not able to attend, which is Alistair Murray, uh, Judith Schultz, and Russell Clinton. So I think the people that we were approaching, we were not able to, to do those as well. Uh, I think there is a real issue here because of, obviously, with the Grenville inquiry and the on ongoing of the Grenville inquiry. We are due to receive evidence next week from the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue right. Service. Um, I would suggest we take the evidence from the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service and then consider at which point we should, because I, if the evidence that is so vitally important that the experts are giving it at Grenville, that raises the question of why we are trying to bring in um, uh, regulations before Grenville has actually reported. And I think there are some real implications here that we need to be cognisant of. If we are content, I would rather have the evidence next week from the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service. And if then, from the from what comes out of that, if then if we then consider uh, looking at some other experts to see if we can actually get some old experts who come and can come and brief us, are we content to take that approach? Yeah. Paul, sorry. Chair, can I ask maybe if Reyes would do a wee bit of research on what actually has happened in? England, Wales and Scotland, because I think there has been action already taken, uh, at the very least uh, consultations, and I know that Scotland is taking a different approach than England and Wales, so it may be the case that we need to do some sort of research to find out a wider panoramic view of what's actually taking place, because whilst the Granville inquiry is continuing, I still think there's something happening uh, outside of that. So. As, as it's happening here with regards to consultation, so I think we just need to find out exactly where we are and all the different methods that's been taken over the jurisdictions. That's I, think I would be content for that. Are you making a formal proposal, Mr. Vice? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. Anybody second it? 
But it, it's plain true. It doesn't need second. But okay, yeah. right, I'm just trying to move. Uh, if we move on to the next item agenda, that payable and PPE imported I from chair, the. Oh, just, sorry. Just a, it's a basic point of information, um, and it's content that it reveals my ignorance on this. Have we had any um, chasing correspondence from the department in terms of us scrutinising these regulations? Are they? I'm just interested to know. Thank you. No. No, no we haven't. Sure, the department is scheduled to give oral evidence on the 9th. We have the companies scheduled for the the second, and there are two experts that haven't responded yet. So we're waiting. Ninth of December. Ninth of December. Ninth of December. And did they, whenever they first laid these, or did they? Was there an indicative timing of when they wanted to have them? I think originally they wanted to have them in place in a December. Right. Although that time has slipped. So if if they have come first since the committee in December, in December, it'll obviously be after. Christmas recess before any other action is considered by the committee. Okay, that's okay thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda was uh, for matters arising was VAT payable and PPE imported from the EU. As matters were considered at the meeting of the 11th of November and information was sought from the Department of Finance, the letters tabled at page 6 is, for the committee, is from the Committee from the Economy seeking for similar information. Uh, members, do we have any comments? I have some, but I just wanted to get your responses first. Um, there's an issue that we'll be aware from the media here. We've also dis heard the evidence or the discussion about VAT payments on second-hand cars mm -hmm. coming into Northern Ireland from uh, the rest of the United Kingdom. There is obviously a considerable degree of concern about VAT and VAT payments across a broad spectrum of goods. It's not just from people. Put it this way. If second-hand cars are at one side of the scale and PP is at the other side of the scale, there's an awful lot in there in between that I think we need to be cognizant of and, and need to have some information about. I would like to write to the department to see if they have had any outline, particularly from HMRC, of the areas that are likely to attract VAT and these areas that, and can they give us a detail of the areas that this is going to be part of? Because I also understand within the agribusiness sector, within also within. Um, uh, farm machinery and a few others. There are already a couple of issues that have been raised about VAT and how this is likely to impact on us. And I think I would like to write and ask for a, a fairly swift response from the department on that. Are we content? Content. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item is the functioning of government miscellaneous provisions, bill notice for amendments. Four members and amendments to the bill is tabled at page at, at 16 November. At, at tabled on uh, was oh, sorry. An amendment to the bill was tabled on the 16th of November for consideration stage and is tabled at page seven. Five members. A notice of withdrawal of amendments was published yesterday, along with a further notice of amendments. These will be included in members' meeting papers on Friday. Do we have any comments? Um, other other than chair, just to. Uh Say that I have put in an amendment also under my name. I just it, it was done, it was completed yesterday, so that's why I haven't had time to get it to the committee. But I will furnish the committee. Well, it's on the it's on the list of uh, notice of amendments now, but uh, I can certainly get a copy to you, Jim, if, if need be. Okay. Okay. Are we content to note? So noted. Uh, if we move on to the SL1 rate relief coronavirus amendment regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, can you invite Ian in? A clerk's briefing note is at page 19. And the SL1 itself is on page 20. Welcome, Ian. Good to see you again. That will be a long day for you in here with us, but let's do the first item in the business, which is the uh, SL1 on rate relief. Uh, the purpose. Uh, the purpose of the rule is to amend the Rate Relief Regulations Northern Ireland 2017 Principle of Regulations to provide that one-off payments, payments in lieu of notice and holiday pay, are disregarded when rate rebate, rate rebate awards are being determined. The proposed rule provides that one-off payments for payments in lieu of notice or holiday pay in lieu of holidays not taken will be disregarded for, claim, for claimants. The rule is subject to negative resolution and assembly procedure. Uh, Former the members has proposed that the rule will come into operation as soon as possible in order to assist new rate rebate claimants impacted as a result of the ongoing economic consequences of the pandemic. Ian, would you like to make a statement? 
Um, yes, just to give a little bit of background on the rate, rebate scheme, um, there has been a mechanism for helping with payment of rates for those on low incomes for um, many years now. Uh, in the past, had been delivered in the form of housing benefit. Um, now, universal credit was introduced um, in the past decade, replaced six legacy benefits, including housing benefit. Therefore, whenever universal credit was introduced into Northern Ireland in 2017, there were changes to the housing support system as a result, and the rate rebate scheme replaced housing benefit for those claiming universal credit. Um, so in order to be eligible for rate rebate, you have to be a claimant um, for universal credit. Um, housing benefit continues to be paid for older people and those not in receipt of universal credit and um, legacy um, claims also. Um, now, the, the way the system works is that in order to avoid people having to put in more than one application whenever they apply for universal credit, we use the information supplied to universal credit in order to make our calculations about the award of the, of the payment. Um, the award is based on the first assessment period for universal credit, whatever income information we have available for that period of time. Um, that makes a straightforward calculation. It doesn't require any additional <coughs> means testing. However, the, there is an issue with the uh, interface and information that we get from universal credit, which means we see an entire amount of income for that assessment period. Um, so whereas universal credit disallows one-off payments like holiday pay and redundancy payments in that first period um, because they have more detailed information than that, um, we don't see what the differentiation is between earned income and those other matters. So for a small percentage of cases, then what happens is that they will, people will be disadvantaged to some extent. Now, the award of rate rebate is um, made on an annual basis, and there's no in-year reassessment. Um, that policy decision was taken because it's much more um, simple to administer than it would be to have monthly reassessments, um, and the number of staff required is, is much less. About 70% of claims um, don't have any change during the year, and those who do change are split between those who earn more and therefore benefit from this um, annual award and those who would earn less and therefore might be disadvantaged by it. A um, smallish number of complaints around this over the period of time that we've had in. The, the issue that has arisen now is obviously with the pandemic. We anticipate that the economic impacts will see larger numbers of redundancies coming through, and therefore, as a consequence of that, more people will be affected by this, um, this issue with the disregard of, of um, or, or inability to disregard one-off payments in the first assessment period. Uh, and therefore more people will suffer financially as a result. So the proposal is that we um, will allow people to um, ask for a reconsideration or a review of their calculation to take account of those one-off payments of holiday pay um, and redundancy um, and therefore get their award changed. Um, and to deal with the um, impact of the pandemic, this is not retrospective legislation, but it will allow anybody who has made a claim since the 28th of March of this year, which is when uh, the um, health protection regulations first took effect in Northern Ireland, um, carried forward, will be able to ask uh, within three months for a reconsideration of their amount. So um, it's, a, it's a measure intended to um, support those who might be adversely impacted by the uh, pandemic. Um, we anticipate that the average value of change uh, is going to be in the region of about £200 per claimant, based on the information that we have <coughs> so far. Um, we, we estimate maybe a couple of thousand people already since the 28th of April have been affected by this, so that the cost will be um, around about half a million pounds, possibly, in the current year. Okay. Uh, any questions the committee has? I'm quite happy to, to do okay. um, You said in an average year there would be, uh, it's a blunt term, but winners and losers, based because it's an annual award. Mm -hmm. um, are there more winners or losers, generally? Um, I th it, it's difficult to, to say, I think, but there, there tend to be more winners as a result of that, uh, with ours fluctuating during the course of the year. And we have, so we make a decision basically to pay our replacement version of the, 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 this payment, the equivalent of this payment was a, a monthly payment, and, and, or was it a monthly or fortnightly in, when housing benefit was? Um, yes, it's not, it's not paid in a, in a cash sum. It's, um, it's a discharge against the rates that are owed. Um, so, uh, in fact, the, the way it works is that it just reduces the rates bill. Ah, okay. Outstanding. So, the, so someone's annual rates bill is just lower because, yes. because they're... Okay, fine. Um, uh, and um, that's different from uh, GB, where they're... They've got council tax relief, so it's a completely different system so, uh, and a totally different scheme. So this is a unique provision for Northern Ireland. Yeah. 
Paul. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Ian. And, and again, this is this is one that comes up in in constituency offices, and myself, probably my staff get it more than me, but it's very hard to understand because of the indirectness of it and the fact that it isn't a monetary sum. It's it's a relief, um, and then that adds to the confusion when you're trying to resolve it for folk. But can you remind the, the committee again just? All the other outside influences that has an impact on this relief, you know, is it is it PIP, is it DLA, is it any of those things, and what other outside influences impinge on this? Rate? Yeah, so um, rate rebate is only paid to those in receipt of universal credit. Mm -hmm. universal credit. So none of the other benefits then um, attach to this. The um, those who are in receipt of uh, PIP or other um, out of work benefits. Um, they are still entitled to housing benefit, and those of state pension age are entitled to housing benefit. Um, now, over a period of time, there will probably be a move towards uh, moving those people on to rate rebate um, as, as different changes are made in the welfare system. Also, anybody who had um, claimed housing benefit before September 2017, when this scheme was introduced, um, and is still entitled to it, continues to be paid that uh, until we work through the managed migration process. Okay. Okay. You. Okay. Right. Are we in agreement? Agreed. Okay. If the members agree, I state that the committee has considered the Department of Finance proposal for subordinate legislation, the Rate Relief Coronavirus Amendment Regulation Northern Ireland 2020, and has no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation at this stage. Are we content? Agreed. Content. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. So we bring in the next two. <coughs> Fees order first, yeah. Um, sorry, just uh, Judith, welcome, but just uh, oh, sorry, sorry, just to correct, this is Christine. Farmer. Oh, it's Christine. Sorry. Yes, yes. I'm the registrar of titles. You're the registrar of titles, yes. so the fees order. Um, team, just to streamline the sort of the, the session as well, we'll deal with the register of titles and the fees order issue first. Then we'll deal with the sort of the, the other substantive issues as, as 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 we go through. I'll give you a sort of a quick briefing on how we intend to propose to run this in a bit uh, beforehand, but just so that you're aware of that. So, Christine, if you want to sort of give your piece first now, and then we'll we'll be able to. Um, get you on your way fairly soon, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you for your time. So the land registry recovers its costs from the fees charged to users of the service. Section 84 of the Land Registration Act, Northern Ireland 1970, requires the land registry to set fees at a sufficient level to meet so much of the operating expenses of the land registry as is attributable to its registration functions. In other words, the funding model for the land registry is full cost recovery. The fees charged by the land registry for various transactions are set out in a piece of subordinate legislation in the form of a fees order. In preparing a new fees order, the aim is to determine fees that will cover the full cost of delivering the land registration service without generating excessive services. To achieve the same, land registration uses a forecast cost model that is built on projections of future income and expenditure. Expenditure is largely within LPS control and can be estimated with a reasonable degree of accuracy. However, LPS has little control over its income. Income is directly related to the number and nature of completed applications for registration and the number of requests for information. These, in turn, are driven by the buoyancy of the property market in Northern Ireland, with a lag time of about three months to allow for solicitor firms to prepare and lodge applications. Transfer fees are charged on a scale, so the value of the property is also a factor. The last fees order was made in 2014, and fees have remained unchanged since then. In recent years, there has been a substantial increase in property market activity in Northern Ireland, which has produced larger amounts of fee revenue. 
Because the fee income is greater than the cost of the registry, this has in turn generated a surplus over the past four years. In normal circumstances, the surplus would be dealt with by amending the fees order to reduce the cost of individual transactions, thereby reducing the total amount of fee income and addressing the surplus. We could not amend the fees order due to the absence of the Assembly between January 2017 and January 2020 because the Land Registration Act requires the fees to be made by regulations that are passed by affirmative resolution in the Assembly. As a result, the income remained higher than the cost of the service, resulting in a substantial surplus. The NIAO highlighted this in its report pub published in 20, June 2020. Now that the Assembly has been restored, we will bring forward a new fees order. In terms of the process, this is all when set out. When are you anticipating that? Well, we are in the process of that at, at the moment. We've actually had started the work um, when the institutions were re-established. So we're expecting that month, two months? Hopefully sometime in 2021. So if, if I just explain, myself as a Registrar of Titles has to convene a Land Registry Rules Committee chaired by a High Court judge with representation from the Bar Council and the Law Society. And we consult with that committee on the proposed fees and then take the draft regulations through the legislative process. The Rules Committee has been formed with Madam Justice McBride acting as the chair. We have put a proposal to the committee regarding the structure of the revised fees order and we are awaiting its comments. The more challenging aspect to all of this is setting the actual money value of the fees for each transaction type. To do that properly, we need to forecast the costs of running the land registry and the volume and the nature of transactions that the registry will receive. We then need to calculate what the fee for each transaction should be in order to raise enough income to cover the costs without generating a surplus. Even in normal times, this is an inherently difficult thing to do because there is no way of predicting with any accuracy how the property market might move and the number of applications the registry might receive. <coughs> However, we endeavour to understand costs and income by looking at trends based on recent activity and market forecasts. We benchmark against other jurisdictions and then we look at options for how the fees should be structured. Given the current uncertainty in the property market, this task is even more difficult this time. We do not know the full extent of the impact COVID-19 will have on the economy. In the meantime, there remains a possibility of further waves of the virus before effective vaccines are available to the population. And we still have to see what the economic effect of Brexit and the furlough scheme will bring. To help us, we have asked the University of Ulster's Economic Policy Unit to give us an assessment of how the likely trajectory of the economy over the next two to three years might impact on the property market. The brief for the assignment given to the University was provided to the Committee with our written evidence. We expect to get their initial findings in December. When we have reached that analysis, we will use it to inform our calculations on the appropriate level of fees and then consult with the Rules Committee. After that, we will bring forward the new fees order to the Committee using the usual process, including an SL1. We will be happy to return to the Committee at that time to discuss the detail further. Ian and myself are very happy to take any questions that the Committee has at this point. One of the things, obviously, we raised in the Audit Office report is with the contractual obligations you have with the contractor who is providing the land web project, who are making a considerable amount of profit out of this, to put it mildly. It's always good to see money coming back into government, but the contractor was receiving a considerable amount of money for it as well. So, obviously, this contractual arrangement is going to remain until such time as this re is reviewed. Um, we are in the middle of um, contract extension negotiations um, with BT um, currently. Hey, uh, just to, to clarify, there is no direct link between the fees order and what BT get paid. Um, the, the transaction fees um, are set in the contract with BT for Landweb. Um, they obviously make up a component part of the fees that are charged for each transaction type, but they, they aren't actually directly linked. 
but they nonetheless have made a significant return from on their in, or on, on their contract. I'm, I'm reluctant to get too much into detail yet because we have to wait for the PAC report to come out. But I, I don't want I don't want to tread on the PAC's toes. But obviously, the, the issue here is that I mean, uh, we're talking about 21. We're talking about financial year 22-23 uh, before we're really getting into the point where we're going to see. Um, we're actually going to see a change in this um, um, not, process. Not necessarily. Um, as Christine's set out, there's a process we have to work through, and it takes a certain amount of time to work through the stages of that process. Um, the, the key thing that we need to work out is how much um, activity there's going to be in the property market, which will then drive what the income is likely to be, and on the basis of that, we can model what the fee should be. So once we get the analysis from the University of Ulster, we'd be in a position to start and work out what the fees themselves might be, then put that to the fees committee. Um, we obviously have to wait for them to come back with, um, with their consultation responses on that. Um, and then we'll bring it to the, the, the committee and the assembly. So we're, we're aiming for this to be in the first half of next year. First half of next year. Yes. So it will actually take effect if it all works um, according to our, our plans um, during the course of the next financial year. Now, um, having said that, we can't, at this point, until we get that analysis done, predict how much, if any, reduction there will be in the fees, because the coronavirus has obviously completely changed the whole uh, economic picture in the property market. So the previous buoyancy that had been exhibited up to 2019 has now disappeared to a large extent, and we're about £4 million, and maybe yes, a bit more down correct. on income compared to right. last year. Okay. And um, have there been any other bidders apart from BT interested in renewal of the contract? We, had, um, we did a pre-market engagement process um, as part of the procurement, so there were um, 16 bidders expressed an interest in it. Now, I think two of those weren't really serious competitors or more interested in a different part of the digital transformation in LPS, which is the joining up of the data, um, but they, they expressed an interest anyway. So 14 um, serious contenders. Yes, and those are both international and local companies. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. Jim oh, sorry, Jim Wells. Um, um, first of all, just out of interest, where does the surplus go? Yeah. Did you generate? Um, well, it's firstly offset against the operating costs of land and property services, um, and then any additional service uh, surplus which is generated after that goes into the department centrally. Um, and then if that produces a surplus for the department as a whole, then it goes into the, the central block for reallocation to other departments. So it could be employing nurses or teachers or something well, ultimately. It usually ends up in the Department of Health, yeah. Yeah, so it's not it's not wasted as such. So there's, there's, yeah. there's no great concern about this. It's unusual to have a, an agency of any department saying we're worried about creating a surplus. That's unusual. Except that, as a general rule, you should only charge users of the service yeah. what it costs to deliver. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I suppose I should declare a slight interest. As you know, the, the Bank of Mother and Father is the eighth largest mortgage lender in, in the United Kingdom, and I'm in that position at the moment, being the, the bank of last resort for my daughter who's buying a house. Now, the market at the moment is going crazy out there because of the stamp duty concession, and houses are, are flying off the, the shelves, as it were. So you're saying that you're three or four million pounds down. Is that not likely to rectify itself quite quickly because of the, the, the mass stampede there is for housing at the moment? Not on the current figures. Um, solicitors generally take um, you know, three to six months sometimes to lodge their applications. So we might see that coming later towards the end of the financial year, but um, our figures are currently sta staying very steady. Though we do appreciate that there um, is a lot of activity, particularly at the higher end of the market, as reported by a number of solicitors. So I'll put that into context. There was very little activity, obviously, in April, May yep. this, this mm -hmm. year, um, and into June and July, although August figures held up quite well, and also September, but they are still lower than they were last year. We, we would expect to potentially um, break even or just be under um, our bu budget line. Yeah, the, the estate agents who have met a lot, recent mm. weeks have met a lot of estate agents, all driving very nice cars, going to say, um, <laughs> have telling me that what they lost in April, May and June has been made up rapidly, that there, there's, a, there's a pent up demand. That plus the fact that a, a potential bag could save maybe £9,000 in stamp duty has meant that the market is really getting quite hot out there. So, but what you're saying to me is that it doesn't really matter to some extent because if it's a surplus, it's going to a good cause. 
it's not sitting in some bank account. Well, it stays in the public sector. Uh, yeah. And if it comes through to us in the monitoring rounds, there will be lots of opportunities to spend it. So, I mean, I can understand. Final question is, I can understand, uh, first of all, thank you for a very clear presentation, lacking in jargon, which is what's appreciated uh, okay. for, 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 uh, for somebody like myself. Um, and I've, uh, because of that, I've lost my train of thought. So, <laughs> no, what, what, I'm, what I'm saying to you is, is that, obviously, um, at the moment, you're okay. Think, think, things are fine. You're not in any desperation here. When, and I can understand why you're saying for three years you couldn't bring forward the subordinate legislation requiring higher fees. Will this become an annual process now that we're back, hopefully, in business on a permanent basis? How often will you be doing this? I think our intention would be obviously to um, keep the fees order under review um, each year. Um, as you can appreciate, it does have to go through a subordinate legislation process, which generally can take in a sort of in and around nine months um, for for that process to be seen through. So it's difficult then, you know, to be doing it yearly um, on a yearly basis. And consultation with the stakeholders is obviously required. And is an important piece of, of, of that piece of, on the legislation. I think it's maybe wise not to have huge haste on this. There's no doubt that when the stamp duty concession drops on the 31st of March and the effects of coronavirus, I think, then begin to be felt, then you might find you're in a very different market as far as land registration is concerned. No, not so much well, farmland and things like that will continue, but in housing, I think you'll find it's going to be a totally different landscape, and it may not be wise to rush through any changes just yet. Yes, well, that is the feedback from our stakeholders. I've been engaging with a wide range of stakeholders um, who are prevalent in the property market, and their initial assessment is that we should be waiting to at least the end of quarter two of 2021 before um, proceeding, because they feel the market will not stabilise, uh, certainly until, until that time. Thank you. Uh, just a, a pick up on a, on a point of that. One of the difficulties we've got here is we're constrained by the, the way the legislation operates. So we have to make a full fees order for any change, either up or down. Yeah. And it has to be done by affirmative procedure. Um, if there was a change to the primary legislation, which would allow us to um, adjust fees downwards um, by negative resolution, that would be a much quicker process. OK. Uh, just, just before I bring the other gym in as well. Does every time the fees get changed, does that mean the contract has to be amended with the provider? No, as I said no. before, there's no connection between the two at all. No. Okay. So even if the fees go up and down or whatever, they don't charge they, a variation order or anything? No, no. The fees were set in when the contract was signed and they're only subject to an annual inflationary increase. Okay. Jim? Uh, just tell us what was the quantum of the surplus in recent years? Um, do you have a picture, sir? I sent a letter to the committee in February, I think, on the subject. Yeah, right. <laughs> there. Right. Oh, no, no. The previous page. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So, um, in 2016-17, the surplus was 3.3 .3 million. In 2017-18, it was 4.2 million, and in 2018-19, it was 12.5 million. So, were those rolled over within land registry year on year, or passed on at the end of each year? Um, as I explained to Mr. Wells, the, the, um, they're offset against the expenses and costs of um, land and property services generally, and then any additional surplus beyond that went back into the centre of the department. And that's done on an annual basis? Yeah, it's done at monitoring rounds. Yes. And was there a surplus back uh, from LPS to central government each year? Yes, there was. And what sort of quantum was that? Um, I think in the um, last of those financial years, 1819, it was in the order of about four and a half million pounds. But there's no facility whereby that surplus could simply be carried forward for land registry into the next year? No, we're not a trading fund, not like HMLR. Because if that had been possible, you simply could have had a fees holiday, couldn't you? Um, except that the fees have to be charged in line with the legislation. So as long as the legislation is there, the fees have to be charged. Remind us what the average fee would be in a house sale of, say, 
200,000. Um, the average um, the average house price at the minute um, is £137,000, so okay. the transfer fee for that, if it's done electronically, is £220, and if it's done on paper, it's £260. Uh, the other point I had, I'm a bit surprised, since the Assembly's been back since January, that we're not very far down the road, so to speak, in terms of revision. Um, well, we had, um, during my time, certainly with LPS, which is two, just over two years, we had um, redrafted the fees in, I think it was late part of 2018, early part of 2019, in anticipation of the Assembly returning. Um, by the time we got to January of this year, that work was out of date, had to be restarted and redone. And then, of course, the pandemic has completely upended all assumptions that would be underpinning the financial model up to this point. So to some extent, I am glad I wasn't here in February with an SL1 for a new fees order, because I would have had to come back and just bin it and start again. Mm. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Pat? Thanks very much, Church. Just a small point, and thanks very much for your presentation. Do you see the scenarios that have come out? I mean, are they are, are all of that, most of that information United Kingdom as a whole based, or how do you siphon that down just to where we are within Northern Ireland? This is the uh, information that we yes. circulated. Um, the reason why we're asking the University of Ulster to give us some analysis is because the information um, is either quite patchy, or people are reluctant to make too many firm predictions, or the information relates to the whole of the UK. So, in order to give us a better picture what the position might be in Northern Ireland, that's why we'll go into university. Okay, so we, we, you, you don't have a lot of that just specifically based to the market here, just what you have on your own record? Is that yes, the? and our engagement with the stakeholders, but as Ian said, a lot of the stakeholders aren't willing at this point in time to commit themselves, yeah. you know, to, to expressing any opinion, as you, as you can imagine, because the market is volatile. Going, right? yeah, yeah. And just not on the market, on unemployment. On the economy, etc. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks, Ron. Gemma, do you want to come in? No, thank you. You're okay. Um, Matthew. Oh, Matthew, sorry. Um, I just a very uh, following on from what Jim Wells was asking about in relation to you were talking about the, the residential property market. Do you foresee any impact from what lots of people would assume to be a big picture for the commercial property sector? Um, around about 80% of the transactions that go through the land registry are residential property. Um, so clearly 20% is a big enough portion of the activity to make a difference. Um, I think that's going to be the more difficult aspect of the economic picture to predict. Um, we're not entirely sure what it will mean for office developments, for example, shops, uh, any other kind of retail activity. Sorry, you can just repeat that last, but I didn't get the, the, that last sentence. Sorry, uh, so we don't at this point know what the impact of the, um, you know, the economic impacts of coronavirus will have on the residential property market is difficult enough <coughs> to um, actually predict what's going to happen in the commercial property market is going to be even more difficult. So we don't know what will happen with offices or shops or other kinds of commercial property uh, in the market, whether there will be an increase or decrease in, in activity as a result. People, in a simplistic sense, people will always need to live in houses. They'll, so you can, imagine, you can assume a certain amount of, uh, we don't know how mm. frothy or how many transactions there will be, but you can, people need to live in houses, so a certain amount of houses will be bought and sold. Um, there is, is some of the work that Ulster are doing for you about looking at what happens if there is a sort of structural shift away from certain types of or large parts of economic activity happening in certain types of physical premises, offices, lots of physical retail. It would seem like COVID might not definitely, but it would seem like COVID is going to herald a pretty big shift away from lots of economic activity that currently happens in physical premises. Mm. Um, it, it could do. Those trends might be longer term than the, the fees order. So um, we're looking for two to three years. Um, obviously, you, you try and uh, update the fees order quite frequently. You know, as Christina said, we review it on an annual basis. Um, but those longer term trends will definitely materialise. There's no, no question about it in the market. Is there, uh, and, and sort of slightly going beyond the with LPS and the fees order, but presumably those are the same trends that would be looked at in relation to. Um, uh, rates policy and yeah, the revaluation. Revaluation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much indeed. 
Christine, thanks very much indeed. Okay, thank, thank you. you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. And Judith on in. Come on in, Judith, please. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks. Okay, team. Uh, this is obviously sort of the, the meat of the, the meeting that we're having today and sort of the key issues we have to do with this. And uh, this <coughs> meeting will take place in open session and then in closed session. I would advise this because of the papers that we've been given and specific implications to do with ongoing sort of uh, activities with the police that we need to be very cautious in our questioning when we're in open session but i will give as much latitude as we can when we're in closed session as well i uh, just want to point out sort of um before we go into detailed questioning one of the issues about this of course is where the responsibility lies between yourselves the department of finance and the department of economy and particularly in relation to the ident identification of payments issuing of payments the identification of ineligible recipients and the recovery of ineligible payments. And I know it was the Minister for Economy who responded to the urgent oral question on the matter, but like the way the, the economy minister tends to, she sloped her shoulders and then passed it in the general direction on the Department of Finance. Uh, sorry, uh, so sorry, slightly re remit, but I think that was that is a fairly clear indication of where we are. So, following reports of the media on the issues of ineligible payments and subsequent responses, an urgent oral question was made on the 2nd of November. The Ministry of Economy stated it had been identified that some 24,700 payments were made with ineligible payments representing less than 2% of this total. The cost attributable to these potential ineligible payments is estimated at approximately 4.5 million, while responsibility for the scheme rests for the Department of the Economy, LPS was designated to administer the payment. I think that sort of populates the sort of the questions we have. So, in open session, uh, Ian, could you just uh, sort of elucidate on that? Okay. Yes. Um, so, as you said, LPS has administered the 10,000 small pounds small business uh, support grant scheme um, on behalf of the Department for the Economy. So, uh, just to go back to um, where it all started, the scheme was announced on the 18th of March by the First and Deputy First Ministers. Um, it opened for applications on the 26th of March. Um, we have paid out just over 24,450 grants, uh, and the scheme formally closed um, on the 20th of October. Now, uh, there has um, obviously been quite a lot of interest in this scheme recently, um, and I'm going to answer any questions that any, the committee has. Um, but since this is the first time we've appeared in front of the committee, maybe if I go back through some of the points and you've touched on them there, Chair, yes, please. Uh, to recap on some of those key points about the scheme itself, the respective roles played by LPS and DFE, um, the limitations of using the rating system as a way of targeting a grant support scheme, and then also some of the challenges which we in LPS faced whenever we were administering the grants. Uh, Ian, because you know, you're, you're a good friend of the committee, do you mind if we get interactive when you go through, no just in case I'm doing Because I think it's important we no. really sort of bottom this out and know where sort of the various responsibilities lie. And I'll give latitude to obviously anybody from the committee who wants to come in. Okay, uh, so the scheme itself in Northern Ireland replicated the scheme which was launched in England um, by the Chancellor of the Exchequer on the 17th of March. Yeah. Um, so that scheme granted a payment of £10,000 to any business occupying premises that qualified for small business rates relief with a total net annual value of less than £15,000. £15,000 or Maybe less than 15 yeah. Okay, there are just over 27,000 properties um, eligible for small business rates relief in Northern Ireland. Um, on the respective roles of LPS and the Department for the Economy, um, because this is essentially a measure to mitigate the economic impact of the pandemic, the responsibility for the policy itself and the funding and the budget for it sits with the Department for the Economy. LPS was given the task of administering the grant. So, and just to get that, so the Department of the Economy set the policy. Yes. So they gave a policy directive and said, "This is the policy directive, and we need to get a mechanism to get it out." Yes. LPS were the obvious place to do it when it comes to do with rates. Yes. But you say there's a trans was there a formal transfer of uh, financial authority for that, or how was it managed? It was managed through a memorandum of understanding between the Department of Finance and the Department for the Economy which set out the respective responsibilities of each party. Can um, we see that? Absolutely, yes. Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, LPS... Um, was Sorry. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Philip. I was just, did, the, did the Department for Economy give LPS any instructions when they were setting the policy in terms of doing eligibility checks? 
Um, they, they did. Uh, whenever the scheme was first launched, the, the number of exclusions was quite small. Um, so we were told um, not to pay MP and MLA offices. Um, vacant properties and anybody in charitable exempt properties weren't to be paid and um, uh, dissolved companies were ineligible at that point. So whenever the scheme started, though, the number of things which we were told not to pay was actually very small. Okay, and so that was in the memorandum of understanding from the Department yes, of the Economy. Yes, it was those terms. Okay, so uh, we got the job of administering this scheme essentially because it was being targeted at recipients of the um, small business rates relief and business premises, so we would know which premises those were. That's why LPS ended up with the primary responsibility for it. Um, now, although we administered the scheme, just to be clear, the payments were issued from the Department for the Economy's budget. Um, um, and it was issued in their name. So anybody who received an email notification of a payment will have seen that it was from the Department of the Economy. It didn't come from Land and Property Services. Now, during the course of the administration of the scheme, we identified problems and issues and queries um, and wanted to check whether or not certain types of business or property should actually be paid the grant. Um, those questions were for DFE to make decisions on because those are the, written to the policy of the scheme. So you identified, you saw something, you didn't think it was eligible for it. You said you went to DFA and said, "Have yes. you give your give us our guidance on this?" Yes, that's right. Okay. So, and, but, and did they respond fairly promptly, or? Um, it, it, the speed varied, I suppose, depending on the issue. Um, some responses came back very quickly, and some some took a bit longer while they while they thought about them. Longer? How long? Um, the latest advice we got was on the twelfth of June. Have you any idea, I mean, off the top of your head, how many times you would have asked that question? Well, Judith did most of that. It, so. it was very ongoing. If I give you just some examples of, of the types of issues that came up, um, you know, the rating system is holds non domestic properties, um, and it's not just purely businesses. So we would have asked questions around things like, for example, clubs, churches, and schools, sites, and yards. Mm -hmm. They all sit within the rating database, and it was to get clarity as to whether the DFE deemed those to be businesses or not, and were they eligible. Um, so it was ongoing right through the scheme, that in, communication. In terms, of, in terms of the 450 uh, ineligible uh, properties that we now know about, I mean, out of those 450, have you any idea how many of times you would have asked the Department for Economy in relation to those 450 properties? Um, yeah, I, I, I'll give, give you a bit of information around. Um, as we went through the scheme, um, it came to light that there were potentially a number of payments either claimed or, or paid in error. And um, as well, I'm sure Ian was going to get, get on to the fact that the whole timing of the scheme actually wasn't the best in that it was towards the end of the rating year. And um, the rating da database, the, the data probably wasn't current because the, the biggest trigger for us in terms of what we call ratepayer changes a notification from rate payers that they have either moved out or moved into a property comes on the back of the turn of year bill or the April bill that we usually issue. So um, there's no statutory requirement for rate payers to tell us that they've moved in or out. And it takes something like... So uh, the first time you would have known was when actually you put out the rates bills, people well, would say... Well, that's the biggest prompt. And unfortunately, the timing just wasn't good. You know, we were talking mid-March and also... We postponed the issue of the bills uh, until June Just for perfect. domestic, but non domestic until September. So, um, and at that stage, um, most accounts would have been settled. Um, and the other thing that lists its contact would be recovery action, and most of our recovery actions were completed at that particular time as well. Okay. So, so, sorry. Just, please, please, please. just in terms of that, so you were asking these questions of the Department of Economy in cases before the money was paid. Was, uh, so, yeah. in terms of those 450, the Department for Economy, economy come back and say they're okay to issue the payment. N no. No. Um, just to just to clarify, that the 450, that they, they make up a, a number of different types. So, um, strictly speaking, only I think 67 of them are actually ineligible under the rules of the scheme. That includes the 52 wind turbines. There are. 12 people who received both the 10 and the £25,000 grant, and we should only have received one. Um, uh, and again, that's due to the timing of this scheme, which I'll come on to a wee bit more. Um, and we normally shared lists of people who received pays or grants, but we missed one group. Um, and so 12 people were paid the two grants in error. And two people received the grant for exempt properties, two charities. 
Okay. Sorry, sorry, Ian didn't pick it up. Again. Two charities. Two charities. Two charities received a grant whenever they're in exempt properties. So that is a list of strictly speaking ineligible. Then we have. Um, uh, that only makes 66. You said 67. Um, I, I actually have the latest figures, and where it's, it's actually down to 64. Um, just again, in terms of publicity around the 450 as such, um, these were ones that we had identified as potentially being claimed or paid in error, mm -hmm. and yeah. um, based on the, the information that we have, and so they weren't um, emphatically, you know, paid in error. Yeah, so, so are the three political offices on top of that? Um, yes. Yeah. In there yeah, no, they're they're included in that. Although, yeah, they they're part of that. Um, Which part? They ineligible. Ineligible. So yeah, mm -hmm. and they are fifty-two. The political parties and uh, the offices should not have been paid. But they um, these figures get confused because sometimes what we quote are numbers which are still outstanding as opposed to the total. Okay. The um, so this we're currently outstanding sixty-six, sixty-seven ineligible payments. Uh, the rest of the 450, just to explain what they are, um, one, of the, um, one of the instructions we got from the Department of the Economy was that one grant should be paid to each business, not to each property. So businesses with multiple branches should receive one grant and not two or three. Um, however, there are circumstances in which um, a, a, an individual may own two separate businesses or two distinct businesses, mm -hmm. um, and they're not two branches of the one business. Um, so of, of the number of potentially ineligible or, or paid in error payments, quite a few are potential duplicates. Um, so those are people who are linked together by bank account details who may or may not be eligible for two payments. Um, so we've identified those. Um, just to put that into context, the um, uh, appeals process that we have been um, applying for people who were rejected um, has taken 950 cases roughly. Um, of those, 60 per cent ended up in a payment being made, um, and the majority of those were relating to this duplicate payment issue or potentially multiple premises issue. Um, then there are also Did the system automatically identify if you got two payments going to one bank account, it would flag it up. Um, yes, we had a check to make sure that happened. But again, we're we're in this. Uh, we'll come to the automatic payments, which triggered quite a lot of these difficulties yeah. uh, in a wee while. Uh, and then we also, because the rating system, and uh, this is one of the difficulties of the rating system, it's not a perfect vehicle for doing this. There's a time lag between real world changes, as Jules explained, and changes in the rating system. So as we become aware of changes in occupation of property, then we have gone back and looked at the payments made and then identified where the information relating to the rate pair change indicates that the person who received the grant was not in the property on which the grant was paid at the time it was paid. So there are about 180 of those. Oh, no, sorry, 130 of those, 180 of the um, um, of the duplicate payments. So what we need to do with each one of those cases is then go to that person because it may turn out that um, the individual or the business has moved from one address to another. Would still be entitled to receive the grant, but we need to make sure that they've actually been paid against the right address. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are quite a number of stages we'll have to work our way through in relation to all of these. And then there are. Um, between 50 and 60 payments which were made to landlords rather than the tenants of the property. Um, and again, we need to investigate those to, to see whether or not the payment was passed on from the landlord to the tenant, which in some cases we are aware was done informally. Right. Sir. Sorry, yes, please. It's not, not a declaration of interest, but I think it's an important point. As a, an MLA, I would have wrote to LPS on a number of occasions during that process on behalf of constituents on some of these issues. Pointing that out. Yeah. So we'll follow up. We'll not hold it against you yeah. yet. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Jim. Um, first of all, can I say that um, you were under considerable pressure from people like myself and many others to rush these out, and you did. And I think, in the circumstances, that had to be done because of the huge problems that the economy was facing in that incredibly difficult time. I'm quite frankly just surprised it's as, it's as little as 2%. I think that's remarkable, given the speed with which you had to move. I'm sure you're feeling, you know, you can't win. You rush the money out to try and save businesses, and then you get criticised when a very small proportion of people get money they shouldn't have got. And in fact, as you're saying, quite a few may actually sh should, should have got it anyhow. Um, so I don't believe the problem is the fact that you rushed the money out. It is that there's 450 people there who may have got money they weren't entitled to and weren't beating down your door, handing it back. How many people 
did actually, without prompting, come back to you and say, Mr Snowden, awfully sorry, but I don't think I'm entitled to this. How, how much of it came back voluntarily? 90 payments so far. 90? 90. Mm -hmm. 90. Now, you say so far, but obviously there was a lot of press coverage about people. How many people knocked your door before it was even known there was going to be an issue? Well, um, before the story broke in the Nolan Show at the beginning of the last week of October, I think we were up to 73 or 4 at that point. Yeah. Right. And what facilities did you have to enable those honest people, and, and public, very publicly spurred, mm -hmm. I must say as well, what facility did you have to enable those people to pay that money back? Um, oh. We provided them with the bank details of the account under which the money should be paid and instructions on how to do it. But how would they have found that out? Uh, well, they contacted, by and large, they contacted LPS um, to say they didn't think they should have received the grant or they had received it in error, or in some cases said, I don't need this money because my business is doing fine. That's very public spirit. And I'll tell you why I'm asking this, because I've moved into a new constituency office and you charged me £119 per annum rates, which I thought was a wee bit generous. I'll have to look into it. <laughs> no, well, I, <laughs> no, I, What's the address? Has it got a roof? <laughs> no, I immediately wrote back to you and said, not to you personally, but to your Craig Avon office and said, look, uh, thank you very much, but I honestly think that my rates are a bit low because I know I'm under public scrutiny and it will appear in the register of members' interests, and people say, well, what's Wales up to? And it was clear that that caused a few hiccups, that process, that they were not geared up for people doing that. So were you effectively geared up to, uh, had you a system in place where that money could have been paid back effect effectively? Uh, well, actually, quite early on in the process, it might have well been the first or second week of April, the first person contacted us saying they didn't want the grant and wanted mm. to pay it back. Um, so uh, we have accountants in the Revenue Benefits Division, which Judith is in charge of, um, we look after the financier, so we nominated one of those accountants to look after all those returned cases. Yeah. Right. And those were all paid back into the DFE bank account because money came out of that bank account. So yes, our staff were instructed to pass on um, the information, but, but really um, you could say all the payments have come back voluntarily in that we haven't actively gone looking for them because we don't have the authority to do that. That was my next, my next question. After, excuse the language, the Nolan Show, mm -hmm. We raised this issue, and, and there was massive publicity. Was there then a rush of people banging on your door, wishing to hand you back ten thousand pound or whatever? It's bad enough, but I wouldn't wouldn't call it yeah, a rush. Yeah, yeah. I think that differentially and talked about there was probably just less than twenty. Less than um, twenty. Mm. Oh, after the Nolan show, a lot more than that actually. Um, now you're saying then that you haven't yet taken action against any of the four hundred and fifty because you don't have the power. You must have, I mean, the rates office certainly have enforcement powers. Um, yeah, the, it goes back to the point about where the money came from. So, as I said earlier, it's it comes from the done. DfE budget. So, each government department is a separate legal entity. So, the debt is owed to the different department, the Department of the Economy. It is, it is them right. who have to pursue the, the recovery process. So, even, even if, if you were chasing after rates, you have the enforcement powers, but because you're administering this on behalf of the Department of the Economy, you don't have the enforcement powers? Yeah. So we're relying on the people who received the uh, ineligible benefits to do the right thing, yeah. no. do it, and do it at the right time. Um, as of as of yesterday, the permanent secretary of the Department of Economy wrote to Sue Gray and asked her to um, get us to um, pursue write letters to all those who potentially received the payments there um, and ask them to repay. As, in fairness, now I have to say that quite a lot of those 450 people um, will not be aware that they shouldn't have received the money. Yeah. I think that's important. I mean, there's people using terms here like honest and, and dishonest. I mean, I think that point is very important that there will be people who think they're entitled to the money who don't know they're not entitled to the money. And I don't think this committee should be casting any aspersions on any of that at this point. But when the point comes when they're written to and say you shouldn't have got the money and then they don't pay it, that's when they've yeah. they no longer have deniability. Now, who. I, I, the relationship between economy and yourself is a complex one. At the end of the day, the letter that they get saying we want our money back, is that on your headed note paper or is it? In no, that will need to be on DFEs. DFE. But but we will come to some sort of arrangement about issuing them on their behalf because we have all the information, all mm. the data. Right. Okay. I, I'll come back later on. But that's very useful. Right. Okay. Sorry, Jim. But if I you, on a second, Jim. Okay. Um, if someone hadn't paid the rates, could they still get the payment? Yes. 
So there could be amongst the 400 people who had defaulted in paying the rates, but yet got a £10,000 handout that you have no power to recover. Um, I suppose you could describe it like that if you want. I'd say just to um, say that it wasn't something that was ignored at the very start of the scheme. We actually asked the Department for the Economy before the first payments were issued whether or not people who were behind in rates ought to be paid. And the decision that was taken was that because this was about protecting businesses and maintaining the economy as far as possible, um, that they should receive the money and we would keep the rate recovery process separate from that. So it was a conscious decision to yes. pay rate defaulters? Yes. And that's in the MOU? Um, I, I don't think No, that I think that evolved after the MOU. That was part of the policy, ongoing policy deliberations. But it was, it was quite early on a decision yeah. was taken on that. Did they send you a formal? Did they send a formal, mem not an MOU, but a formal note that this is part of the policy? I think it was in an email I had seen in the early. Oh, can we see that as well, please? I'll, I'll if I can find it again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, don't use that language here. Oh, no. <laughs> the answer is yes. We would yes. love to show you the email. <laughs> I would say this. We have been quite scrupulous about keeping records of everything which is yeah. related to decisions taken about this scheme. So there's thousands of pages of documentation on how decisions have taken um, through the course of the delivery of that, that programme. Yeah. No, because that's, the MOU is one thing, but the issue about what we've just discussed, I think it's important that we, we get to see that, because that is part of the, the mechanism of the process. That comes to, you know, the fact that you were able to deliver this scheme with so little ineligible payments and the fact that you know we're only highlighting on a few areas of ineligible payment shows in the fact that it, it, it really succeeded in its intent. Mm -hmm. But you know, unfortunately, this is public money, and our job as, as a scrutiny committee is to investigate areas where that, that, that deviates from the norm, and that's why we're specifically looking at to do that as well. Uh, Jim, you had another yeah, question? Yeah, a few other questions, if I might. So it was clear from the beginning that political offices shouldn't get the money. Uh, but we now know that three did. Are we satisfied it's only three? Um, yes. Right. I, if, if you'd like, I'd explain how that happened. Yes. Please. Okay, um, we had identified that we did need to have those taken out of the list of the payments. Uh, yes. So uh, a member of staff had compiled a list of all of the MP and MLA offices in Northern Ireland um, and tried to, tried to identify all of those from... Um, information on the Assembly website and the Parliament website, and then also by doing internet searches. Uh, so we had produced a list that covered everybody, we believed. Um, that list was given to the member of staff whose responsibility was for preparing the payment files. She had written into the payment file um, a piece of code which said that identified all these addresses, the property ID numbers, and then where they were to be flagged in the payment file and then to be taken out. The problem was that there was an error in the code, the syntax of the code, which meant that although the payment was flagged, it wasn't actually removed from the list. As a consequence then, in the first batches of automatic payments that went out, then those offices were in. It was noticed then in the third batch, and this is when the correction was made. Um, so it was just simply um, a human error, I suppose, if you want to describe it in those terms. And what okay. was the date that those that first 26th of March. 26th, so 26th of March the first yeah. payments out. And those were the payments that went out directly without application? Um, yes. Were there any applications made for political offices? I don't no, know. No, not, not that we're not aware of. Know of. Okay. Uh, I just want to understand, walk you through this so as I properly understand it. I have a constituency office, as everyone else here is. I'm the rate pair. Mm -hmm. So, if I didn't pay my rates, you would issue the debt process against Jim Allister, MLA. Yes? If that's the name rate. Yeah. And you would do that even if the rate pair ID was Jim Allister MLA dash Alamina TUV office. Um, well, if we couldn't track you down, then we'd go after the TUV for the way. Yeah. But first and foremost, I would be the, the debtor. Well, you're the name person, so you're yeah. the person we look for mm -hmm. you. And likewise, if there was a windfall through the rates 
whereby I was entitled to money, it would come to me. Um, as a mere pair? Yeah. Yes. It would come to me whether I'd said Jim Allister, Balamina TV office, or just Jim Allister. Um, no, it would, the cheque would be issued in that name. Yes. Um, if a payable order was being issued, or if it was being paid into a bank account, it would be paid into the bank account from which the rates were paid. Yes. So I, in those circumstances, would be both the recipient and the beneficiary. Um, well, I suppose you could, yes, those yes. words you want to use. Now, if in dealing with my rates account, I wanted someone else to deal with it, not least because of data protection orders uh, issues, I would have to authorise that person. Is that correct? Um, you would have to authorise a person to speak to LPS and deal with us on, behalf, yes. on your behalf as a count. No. I mean, if you asked your constituency worker, office worker, to pay the rates for you, then we would take the rates off that person. Yeah. In fact, on NI Direct, there is the third party authorisation form. And it expressly says, in order to safeguard your data and fulfil our obligations under the Data Protection Act, we will only enter into a discussion about your rate account with you or with a third party you nominate to act on your behalf. If you'd like to authorise a third party to act on your behalf, please complete and sign this form and return it to the LPS office. That's the process. Yes. And Just without that form, you wouldn't be talking to anyone else. Um, not about no. any issues to do with payments or um, refunds or changes yes. to the rate pair account. No. Well, can just, I ask you this? Just, just, Jim, just, just for a moment of clarity here. Most MLA offices, our rates are paid directly through right. the Assembly, aren't they? Yes. No. No, they're, they're claimed back, I think, through the Assembly. Claimed back, through, but no, they, no. the Assembly make the payments on our behalf. So I've only been here 26 years, so I can explain <laughs> to you. I give you the option. What, what happens is the vast bulk of us send the bill up to the finance office without the instruction to pay directly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it comes out of the Assembly's bank account, not yeah. ours. You do have the option of paying it out of your own account and reclaiming it, but very, very few people would do that. There's but do, we, do we know how many point, people do? On a point of information, there's 14 MLA offices who pay direct. 14? All right. As far as I know. Chair, could I just finish this point? Yes, sir. So, go ahead. so if I want to authorise someone to deal with you on my behalf in respect of my office, I need to furnish you with a third party authorisation form. Um, for a Principally, this is for domestic rate accounts, okay, you understand that point. Um, for any organisation, non-domestic rate pair, quick, obviously you'd be dealing with a lot of companies and other organisations, yes. so you wouldn't require a third party authorisation form to deal with those kinds of rate accounts. Now, um, if it is in the name of an individual... Um, well, take my account, okay. Jim Allister, MLA, maybe Bellamina TV office. So if, um, is it Pamela who works in your office? Pamela, um, yes. Yes. So Pamela was to. You're well informed. I have paid my rich bill this month. I have paid my rich bill this month. Um, or, or Jessica in Paul's case. Okay. So. Uh, <laughs> if you were to contact. Ian, Ian, are you going to target all of our workforces? <laughs> um, was to contact us in relation to your rate account. I think we would take it on trust as a constituency worker of that office that you, they were authorised to act in your behalf and wouldn't require that third party authorisation to be signed in those cases. Can you tell us, in the case of the three political offices, were there any authorisation forms signed? Uh, I'm not done on there, but I would no. need to check. I'll find that out for you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matthew. Thank you, and thank you both um, for coming in your evidence. And obviously, I'd echo what was said before about um, uh, you know paying tribute to LPS in terms of how quickly they administered the scheme in extraordinary and unprecedented circumstances. And I'm sure it's um, uh, some of the some of the coverage probably caused a, a degree of um, uh, disquiet or stress among LPS staff. But I don't think there should be any doubt that they were. Um, working very hard. I just wanted to clarify um, a couple of points to, to ensure I've understood it. What you're saying is that um, it was effectively done 
the payments were made automatically and a code, do you mean as in literally computer code, was created to, to instruct the payments not to go to... So it wasn't the case that there were a list on a, an Excel spreadsheet of AEs that had to be ticked off. So they, there wasn't that. It, was, it wasn't the case that someone looked at a at, a, at an office with a you know a political office and said yes. Mm -hmm. um, clarify one point on yeah. the, the political offices. Okay, so um, what I was describing to Mr. Um, Mr. Alster there was the process for looking at MP and MLA offices. Mm. Um, Political offices were not explicitly excluded at the outset of this process, part of political offices. Um, we received, we queried this. Just, just one second, please, Ian. Has anybody got their mobile phone that's fairly close to a microphone? Because okay. we're picking up quite a lot. Right by me, possibly. Hold on. There you go. Okay, so um, MP and MLA offices were specifically excluded from the outset. Um, our staff noticed, I think, in the second or third payment run that there may be party political offices included within the list. Mm -hmm. um, and we asked the Department for the Economy whether these were also excluded, expecting the answer to be yes, but we needed to, to clarify with them. Um, and we, we got um, advice on that point on the 10th of April in relation to those. That they were excluded? That they were excluded, yeah. So um, at that point, then, in one of those um, initial just, just for a point of clarification, Ian, but wasn't when they... Uh, I'm just trying to think here, but wasn't when the small business grant piece went out... On the, in March, there was something that specifically said that uh, yeah, the following right. people cannot yeah. claim. Yeah. One was political offices and MLA's offices and the rest of it. Because party constituency offices? Party yeah, constituency but it was offices. actually non-constituency offices. Non -constituency. Yeah, but yeah. That, that went out in this or whatever date it was in March. Uh, um, we, yes, we, got, we asked that, I think it was on the 31st of March, because we had identified it at that point, and then we received a response on the yeah. 10th of April. So that 31st of March, so that, that, yeah, okay. And, and so are you... Are you are you confident now that none of the other 450 are party political offices either? Oh, we, we, we know what they are and know who they are. Yeah, okay. Um, so they're, they're definitely... Did I hear you say earlier on, um, and I'm, I think I may have misheard this, but I just want to confirm, um, but e there was an email that went from the economy department to all or some of the recipients? So whenever a payment was released, mm. um, it's all done through the account NI um, payment system, computer yep. system. Um, so for bulk payments of that nature, they went into the account NI system. Um, and the first payment batch were 6,775 payments. Um, so everybody who received the money would have been paid by BACS, and everybody who received the money, if we had an email address for them, will have received an email. And if they didn't have an email address, then they received in the post a remittance mm -hmm. advice. And it will have said on the top, on the header of that, that the money was from the Department for the Economy, COVID-19 Small Business Grant Scheme. Ooh. No, no, there's no one who could have got the money who wouldn't have been contacted by you on behalf of the Department of the Economy to say the money was paid? Yeah, there were, there were, something yeah, would have been it, it came straight out of Count and I. It's a standard Count and I process that yeah. they will issue an advice when they make a payment. So it's not just money appearing in an account that's the prompt for people, yeah. not just whether people, you know, some people check their accounts, obviously some, some people have apps. You get a, you get a, you get a notification that says yeah. you, you have yeah, been paid. And that came from the Department of the Economy. Yeah. I have to say, also, um, just to put that in a little bit of context, but it, quite often um, those system-generated emails end up in spam folders, so they wouldn't yeah. automatically appear in somebody's inbox, and we have to continually remind people yeah. to check spam and junk. What proportion do you know of uh, so those email? Just so I'm clear, the email, those email addresses, are they held because you happen to? They're, it's held because they're rate payers, and some rate payers you have their email. Okay. Um, but it's the case that perhaps some older premises have been, you would imagine, have been repairs for a long time and they have never provided an email address, so they get a postal. Okay, fine. Um, that's helpful. And, and and those letters would have hit people's, even if it was posted to them, it would have hit people's... Um, for the first batch? Um, yeah. yeah, first week of April, probably. First week of April, yeah. yeah. And, and, um, and in terms of uh, the legal... The legal standing now, as it were, in terms of recovering any monies that haven't been paid back voluntarily. Mm -hmm. um, if someone has money that hasn't been paid, whoever, you know, whoever they are has money that hasn't been paid back, they're not breaking any law at the minute for not paying it back. Is that right? Um, no, the, the recovery process will be civil recovery. Yeah. Mm. So it, it's effectively a, a civil recovery, sorry, but they're on what it's civil recovery. 
on the on what legal basis? Um, on the basis that you owe me the money, I mean, in the sense that um, it's like the, the rates are like that too. There is no, it is not a criminal offence not to pay, pay rates. rates. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so if, if Matthew O'Toole chooses not to pay his rates and we have to pursue him for his rates, um, then we don't actually criminally prosecute you. It's not like TV licences yeah. or um, or the uh, master's bill or yeah or, or fraud on social security benefits, which are criminal offences. These I meant your that's meant an your amendment I hadn't thought of. Okay, everybody, hold on. So, so we have to then pursue civil recovery processes through the enforcement of judgments office and go to the county court getting a judgment. Right. Okay. Order payment. Yeah, that that's one of other pathways. You know, there's things like small claims court out there as well, but we choose to go through magistrates court. And are there many? Are, are there are there active? Have you reached active proceedings in that regard yet, or are you still in the process of letting to people in relation to the grants? Yeah. Uh, no, we haven't started any of that yet. Okay. Um, and I should say, finally, before I turn over, to, to de declare my interest, I've just opened a. It hasn't actually been opened yet because of restrictions. It's at 30 University Street, just so you know, and I will be. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the the news being made. I'm glad <laughs> to see that. So, if I, for whatever for any reason, I'm in tardy in getting in touch, you know where I am, literally. <laughs> it's a disclaimer. <laughs> it's a well, reminder. I'm using it as a reminder, so I didn't forget. Well, well, first of all, I think it has to be acknowledged once again, Ian, uh, and just the, the tremendous work that you put in over the last nine months uh, in getting this money out. I don't think this committee or any one of our mem this membership here will ever be critical of you uh, with regards to this media story and storm, because we recognise and we acknowledge that through letter to you or appreciation in the work you've done and your staff um, done in getting that money out to businesses when they needed it badly. Your knighthood is safe. Uh, can, can, and, and I will pass on my your wishes to uh, Jessica. Okay. Uh, uh, so, the, the, the three offices... Oh, sorry, first of all, let me, let me take you back to the wind turbines because it's uh, an interest of mine with regards to energy policy. Can we also chuck in the anaerobic digesters as well? Yeah. Because I'll uh, be coming back to that. So I yeah, think absolutely. So, so those, those two aspects, what puzzled me about that was, is it 52 wind turbines, I think is the itemised total for wind turbines, not uh, excluding the uh, anaerobic digesters, of course, but are we saying that it's 52 wind turbines that should, owners that should not have received any payments? Because it strikes me that there will be business owners have wind turbines. So are we saying that they received one payment and that person happened to have a wind turbine? Or are we saying that those people received payment because of the wind turbine and they shouldn't have received it? Because of the wind turbine? So it's actually the wind turbine is the rateable heritage yeah. in yeah. the... Um, in because the wind the turbine, turbine is designated as the business? Yes, yeah, so it is the thing on which the rates are liable. Yeah. Right. So, so it is possible that you could have two wind turbines. Are we saying that they that a person may well have received two payments for two wind turbines and another payment because they happen to have a business on site? Um, if the wind turbines are each separately valued um, and they're not classed as a wind farm and the value is £15,000 or less um, and they have set up each of those wind turbines as a separate legal entity and a separate company, um, and the separate company is the rate pair name in each case, then that is possible that could happen. Okay. Is that the same with anaerobic digesters? Um, yes, and peat bogs and landfill gas collection and generator points. Um, there are all kinds of strange energy generation facilities which popped up in the middle of this process. And they all got small business grant? Um, small business grant relief. Yeah. 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 Any of those public bodies? Um, wind turbines, no. Or the other, the heat extractors? No, well, public bodies were excluded from yeah, the yeah, so no, yeah, they're, they're excluded they're from they're small business rate relief. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, apologies. Uh, sorry, we, sorry. We, 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 interrupt, we interrupted no, no, with Walt. Okay. No, no I, don't, I don't mind. Uh, we're all friends here. Uh, so, uh, see, I, I get very clearly how there could be, because I think I've put some your way, Ian, uh, whereby a <coughs> landlord who either has retired or stopped functioning as a business and then has rented out that space to a younger business proprietor. Yeah, I can understand how the landlord would have got paid. 
should have really passed that on, but didn't. Mm-hmm. And then there would have been so many, you know, an inquiry or an investigation run into that. Can you can you can you amaze the total for that type of landlord redundant landlord payments? I suppose is the way you would pass it. Um, it'd be very difficult to separate them out in that way. I mean, there are fifty-five, Judith. Fifty-seven. We've identified where the landlord may have got the grant instead of the tenant. Mm-hmm. And has that been triggered by the fact the tenant has come back and said, "Sir, I haven't got the money." It, it, and you, you said, yes, you have, and they've gone, no, well. Yeah, yeah. in the main, that, that would be the case. Now, yeah. In 35 of those 57 cases, the tenant then subsequently applied for the grant as well. And in 22 cases, then no application was made in respect of the same property. So um, um, I don't know whether that means that the landlord passed the money on to the tenant and the tenant didn't feel it was necessary to do so, in which case there's no problem, really, mm. or whether or not the, there was no case of the property, which is a different issue. We'll have to get the money back off. Yeah. Cases, but we'll need to investigate each one of those cases to yeah. find out. The, the, the other test that we did that would have identified some of those other landlords was we looked at bank accounts to see if there had been payment elsewhere, and some of them fell into that category were landlords. Just before we leave the wind turbines, it does worry me that the Chief Executive of Land and Property Services in first name terms with every female in every constituency office. <laughs> <laughs> every female. That's <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> that is remarkable that you well, first you're ringing them on a daily basis. No, well, they're, they're ringing him. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, subsequent to that, this prompted me to ask you a few question, written questions. And what emerged with there's 509 wind turbines in Northern Ireland getting small business rates relief? Yes. Oh. Yeah. And then. Parallel to that is the report from the audit office showing that those turbines, as a sum total, will get over £5 billion worth of subsidy over the next 25 years. How on earth did we reach a situation where such a, a cash generating machine, that's all you could really call it, is getting, in one case, a total of £375,000 worth of subsidy from land and property services? How did that arise? Um, the Small business rate relief. Um, it was the policy was decided in 2010 and passed through the executive and has been annually reviewed um, and, and reinstated then each year since 2016 onwards. And so most recently, in fact, it was it was with the committee in June, I think, of this year for renewal for the current um, financial year. Um, it, the scheme basically applies to every single rateable hereditament with an annual value of £15,000 or less. Um, to that extent, it replicates the schemes that exist in England, Scotland and Wales. Um, and everybody in that band is in receipt of that, unless you own multiple properties or there are some other exclusions. How could a heredimment that's generating an income after four years of pure profit ranging from £62,000 to £125,000 a year, how could that be less than £15,000? Well, that's what the the valuation would be based on the amount of revenue which is generated by the by the wind turbine. But the revenue is colossal. So how come they're rated as less than fifteen thousand? Um, I don't know that the precise formula would would be, but the rateable value would be a proportion of, pardon me, of the income generated by the by the by the wind turbine. Right. Well, I think there's a clear savings to the taxpayer in excluding wind turbines. Now, of course, the problem was when this was first established in 2010, there were very few wind turbines, and now they've been growing you know, enormously in numbers. The exclusion of that would yield a windfall to the taxpayer, and that money can be spent much better elsewhere. And for wind turbines, we can read anaerobic digesters. And, yes, anaerobic digesters. And, uh, why that's relevant to this is that because they were getting small business rates relief, that then generated the £10,000 refund uh, grant, yes. which they didn't need, clearly didn't need. Now, did that not show up, those 52, did that not show up very early on? Um, well, we, we identified them in LPS before the second payment batch went out, and that's when we first raised the query with the Department of the Economy about whether they wanted to pay them or not. And the response from the Department of Economy was? Um, verbally. Um, to not pay on the 6th of May, but the written confirmation didn't come until the 12th of June. Okay. Yeah, just, that, that's a very fast. The, the issue around small business rate relief for the turbines is, a, is a, a very interesting topic, and I think it's one that we may well want to mm-hmm. touch upon in, in, in later weeks and months, because there is a, 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 an efficiency and an, an unfairness there. You don't live in a turbine. You don't 
operate a business in a turbine, um, so, uh, you do generate money and you do generate energy. You generate energy and you get money from that, and then you, because you generate energy, you get the rock payment, mm -hmm. which is which is a lot more, I would suggest, than the than the rateable value that we're talking about. So that's yeah. something that we think we should explore and return to. O on the on on the then on the political offices, and you've been very open here, Ian, and and, and described it in a very okay. good way, no basic way, in that. So you're saying that the, f the three officers that were aff uh, affected here and paid in our went out on the 26th of March. You then queried it when you realised and you went back to the department. The department came back on the 10th of April. So how were those, how, how, was, how was that first batch of payments decided upon? Who was selected and how were they selected? Not, not just the, um, the officers paid, but, but a batch of payments in its entirety. Okay, um, can I just correct something before we go on? Okay. So the, right, the, the three payments were um, to two ML, no, one MLA office and two MP offices. Um, two of those were for current members, okay, um, and those were should have been excluded from the list and were missed. Then there was a third one which was paid from a member of parliament who was, um, what's the correct word, not elected in December of 2019. Okay, mm -hmm. so she wasn't in the list be excluded, although um, her name was still on the rate account. Now, um, I, I wouldn't want to give anybody the impression there was any kind of selection process was going on. We started off with a list of about 16,000 direct debit rate pairs in the non-domestic rating system. Mm -hmm. Then we tried to strip out everybody we knew was a vacant or end dated account and all the other exclusions and removing all of those as far as we could till we ended up with the, what we thought we could stand over. Um, and the best that we could do at that point was 6,775. Yeah. Okay, so the selection process was basically what we could be confident was right to pay at that point out of that potential list of 16,000. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Uh, now, from what I can find out, there's 14 MLA officers who pay rates directly to LPS. Do not come through the finance systems here in Stormont. That could be for a number of reasons. I think the, the biggest reason is the fact that they don't comply with the rules of the assembly. There's 14 MLA officers. I, I then would assume that you can add on then other political officers, party political officers and MPs officers on top of that. How, how was it that, how was it that then that out of that 14 and, and others, there was three or four paid, even in there? How would that have worked out The, the ones that were paid would have been those where we had one bank account listed against the, the against the rating account. There were there were other rate accounts where we had multiple bank account numbers um, for direct debit payments. So the the business owner or who was responsible for the rate account may have used a number of different rate accounts to pay the rates over the years, and we were holding details from more than one. So then we needed to establish which was the correct account in which to pay. Mm -hmm. um, if you have one bank account detail, you know which account. Is connected to that rate account, and so those would be the ones that were picked. I can't speak to the other 14 because I don't know who they are, but it's possible that they paid their rates by check, and it's possible that they paid in one go, um, or they turned up at one of the LPS offices and paid over the counter. It's I don't know. So there is a just on a there is a confusion then, and and uh, on the media, uh, and and I think that. What I found unique about this was I think that it was either LPS or the Department of Finance communicated to Stephen Nolan's show directly to say that Mr McHugh was the account holder. Sir, Mr Chairman. I object to my name being used in this discussion given the... Uh, you, you have already identified... I, I, I have done that and I was just at this very moment in time I was about to sort of bring up the uh, sort of... Ask, Ask the vice chair to reconsider his remarks and take those back. Well, I'm just trying to get to the kernel of an issue that right was raised. Chair, in the I media. don't care what he's trying to get to. I want him to take that back. Take what? In your back? instruction. Didn't say anything. Uh, chair, I'm simply asking a question because the Department of Finance or LPS directly contacted a media programme. 
um, and gave them. Can I, can I just correct that? Yep. We respond to media queries. We don't go. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yep. so there was no. Sorry, just just for clarification, uh, was from the Department of Finance. So obviously, you responded to requests from the Department of Finance for a piece of information. We that, are part of the Department of Finance. Yes, yeah, I know that. But sort of, you, you, you yourselves would not. You do not run your own press organisation. The sort of the Department of Finance runs the the, the yes, press communications office. part. The, the press office, press office yep. covers all of us. Okay. Yes. So it wasn't you giving the information, it was going through the Department of Finance. So you addressed a query that came in from the media show, and you responded to say that Mr McHugh... Uh, sorry, uh, sorry right, Mr Chair. Uh, Chair, Chair look, we're, I've given, I'm giving the committee a, a lot of latitude here, because I think this is an important issue that needs to be explored. However, I've already identified that there, are other, there is other... Uh, avenues being taken on this partic particular issue, and I don't want to either prejudice those, or I do not want to particularly embarrass the, the other member here who's in, in this in this meeting. So, I am when when we are talking about this issue, I think if we talk about the generalities, I am content to take this as an issue. But anything more specific than that, I will have to rule that rule on that. I, I'll put the question. Thanks. Sorry, just to, to the chair as well. Could I also? I remind the Chair that, as I had said at our last meeting, that there are legal considerations here. And if you remember, I uh, insist in making comment that in any way uh, is defamatory of me. And I challenge him to say exactly the same thing outside of this chamber. And let's not let him use that as an opportunity to be making any remark in any way it's defamatory against me or my character. That, is, that, that, that has been so noted, and yeah. I have made my ruling. Chair, so so can I, if I can ask the question, and again, Mr McHugh can threaten me all he likes, but I'm trying to get to the truth, and that's what this committee should do. So I'll ask that question all the way. Of the query that you responded to the media programme, where you named a person as being the account holder, are you saying that that was wrong, because that now has been disputed by that alleged person? Not sure, Chair. I'm comfortable getting into this because it's it's kind of a roundabout way of. I would, I would, I would agree, and I think I would, I, I would think, Mr. Vice Chair, I've given you a lot of latitude, and I think I will rule on that. It's not 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 an acceptable line of questioning. Okay. But I, I respect your ruling, Chair. Thank but you. There is three officers, and we know who they are. It's Philip. You're next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so. Was there any political offices that were possibly going to receive this payment that were took off the list? Um, I'll need to go back and check, but we wouldn't have gone and asked a specific question to DFE unless we'd identified some. Okay. And in terms of the three uh, offices that w there was money paid out, you said that there was some kind of coding error. Did that coding area exist with any other payments? Um, it's um, not that we've been able to identify that there was a problem there. I mean, in, in fairness to the individual concerned, um, she was absolutely pivotal to this entire operation. So she was trying to create these payment files, and she was working 12 and 14 hours a day for in excess of two weeks. Uh, I mean, it, it, it would be completely... Um, inappropriate to give any kind of impression that this was some kind of incompetence at work here. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was an honest error, and, and absolutely will stand behind her for all the work she's done in relation to it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm not disputing that. I'm just trying to figure out was it an honest error that only affected these three uh, payments? As far as we've been able to identify it is. Yeah, yeah if I can say, um, in in terms of the other groups that were excluded, a lot of the information was already held in the rating system. And we you know, was uh, had a designation and could be identified. In the case of um, MP MLA offices, there's no designation on the rating system at all. So that's why it was a offline ad hoc list, which then there was a piece, piece of script written to exclude those. Okay, and I mean, obviously we've, we've had the information that this is a DFE scheme, uh, but was administered through the LPS. Uh, so, in terms of the payments, was it the LPS? I, mean, I know it came from the DFE account. So, if a payment was to be made, the information was provided by the LPS. Was it was it the LPS paid it, or was it the DFE paid it? And 
I'm trying to figure out if somebody somebody at the DFE end should have been circumventing or checking or scrutinising the payments as well. So the process was we put together the payment files. Um, the first payment file was, as I said, 6,775. The second one was 3,225, and the third one was 3,160 something. Okay, so there were 13,000 payments paid out in a very short order. Um, there was a quality assurance check undertaken, and Judith was involved in some of that work at the time. But as you can imagine, if you're looking at a list of 6,000 plus mm -hmm. payments, it is going to be incredibly difficult. So the quality assurance was done at the LPS side? It was done. Then the payment file was sent to um, the Department for the Economy for them to approve. Um, I'm not cited on what checks they undertook there, but again, I'm assuming that 6,000 plus or 3,000 plus mm -hmm. listings on a massively long spreadsheet or payment file is going to be incredibly difficult to spot. But Ian, is LPS, you're used to doing this. I mean, this is your bread and butter. Who um, has the Department of the Economy got the bandwidth to check even? 10, never mind. Everybody was under enormous pressure at that point. And I would also say um, that at the time these first papers were made, on the 26th of March, we were at that point in lockdown. Yep. So um, th at the time we went into, into lockdown and staff were instructed to go home, only 35% of LPS's staff had any kind of laptop or were able to work remotely. And we had no remote access to the rating system. Um, and it was incredibly small number of people who actually were core to this. I, mean, mm -hmm. I think at that point there might have been a dozen of us, Judith. Yeah, there, right. there were. Um, in, that, in revenue and benefits, we had actually only about 20 laptops between us to start with. Yeah, yeah. And, and no access. So whilst we did what we could, there was always going to be, at this point, an inherent risk. Now, I suppose with the benefit of hindsight, you could say, well, maybe you shouldn't have put that automatic batch of payments out. Um, the only thing I would say in response to that, having been able to get in excess of 13,000 payments out in the first week of this scheme, if all of those had to be flushed through the application process, we may still be yeah. at, at today's committee. We wouldn't be talking about why did we rush those payments out and make those errors. We'd be talking about why you still not paid after six months. Yeah, and I think just just listening to this and listening to the evidence of saying this, the point comes as you know, the recipients were informed in early April that they had this payment. So it was up to them if you know if they received the money or didn't receive the money as it was supposed to have been received. They had the you know they had the opportunity then, and that you know, bearing in mind the difficulty of getting this out to be able to support Northern Ireland business and the rest of it, you've probably done you've done an incredible job. But you know there is an onus when this you know when people were informed of this money to decide whether they should have had it or not, and it sounds great to do with that. Sorry, Philip. Yeah, I mean I'm, I'm extremely glad that we're not having the conversation about not. Businesses not having repaid, been paid six months, uh, and there's a lot of businesses that have been able to survive the last six months because they've received this payment. So at that point, uh, as already been made, and I'm just going to echo it. In terms of the filtering process, have you any idea how many payments weren't made because of the filtering processes, either within the LPS or the Department for the Economy? Um, on our side, um, there, there are something in the region of about 11,000 applications which came in which didn't result in a payment. Okay. Okay. So now that would have been for a variety of reasons, mostly duplicate applications um, or repeated applications, but also not eligible um, for a variety of reasons, um, and um, a, a large number of others which we didn't actually push through because then um, we did get communication from the Department of the Economy about them not being eligible. Um, so just to, you know, as by way of a bit of context, by the 15th of April, so that was um, Easter Tuesday, I think, um, we were holding at that point 1,100 cases awaiting decisions by the Department of the Economy about eligibility, including car parks, sites and yards, electricity generation facilities, telecommunications masts and um, ATM machines, all of which would have been entitled to small business rates relief. So, I mean, just final last question. In terms of the Department for the Economy, I mean, you were asking them questions and they were answering that. I mean, mm -hmm. off their own bat, was there many times when they would have come back and said, you know, through their own filtering process, we don't think this is a, a, a legitimate payment? I can't recall them at the payment approval stage doing that. No. Okay, yeah, so that never happened. the payment approval, um, it, was, it was just around the policy decision as to whether those payments were in or not. Um, no, they didn't eyeball the payments that went out. Um, yeah. We had a whole series of controls around that, including the final check, and uh, we, we would have made a recommendation to them and set out you know, the checks that we had done, but they ultimately approved 
the payment? Well, they, they basically approved 100% of the payments that, that yep. you put forward. Well, they took assurance from us and the procedures that we put in place that they, the payment files were, were accurate. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, That's very much, Chair. And again, thank you for coming in. And just at that time, there were a lot of businesses and everybody else's equity here uh, that would have found themselves at the wall without that. We know an answer to our Chair. Uh, what the church said they, they were unique circumstances and businesses are used to what they're doing best that's trying to turn their income it was impossible it dried up there for them my questions are about uh, i heard you said about the department of the finance and the department of the economy and uh, the issue of the payments and the identification the eligibility of the recipients and the recovery recovery of those payments You've already said that it can't be done through law. Could it be forced through law through the Department of the Economy? Um, I'm not a lawyer. So you don't have the powers to do it through law. Um, no. The, no. So, yeah, but the Department of the Economy could take civil legal proceedings in order to recover the money. Yeah, Chair. Most of the, these comments that, that 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 I have here, I mean, a lot of the questions have been answered. But I think there's a lot of work here to be done by this committee to get to, like, I mean, I'm going to go on here to the uh, aerobatic digesters. What is the rationale for not excluding the renewable energy generators uh, to meet the aims of the scheme, who are already substantially uh, subsidised already? I think, but, Pat, that's an interesting one because the vice chair brought out a very yes, good point, and I think maybe, and I'll put this to the committee yeah, afterwards, the, point, the evidence. Yeah. But I think we should be taking this as an area to invest for an area 100%. for investigation. Sorry, three right, if it's a department for an economy scheme, I'm not sure how our involvement in it is. Mr. Catney is suggesting that they shouldn't be able to respond. It's depriving us of a huge amount of rates. Rates. Yeah. LPS. Yeah, yeah, the rates. yeah, I'm talking on the rates. It's the rates, Philip. I mean, because they're already very heavily subsidised, and I suppose. With all of that that's going on, are there any other specific groups that could be reasonably excluded from this small uh, rating scheme that's going on on the grounds that they do not fulfil the aim of the scheme? Have you come across any other ones that, that we haven't mentioned here today? Um, um, now, it depends on how they are owned and what the, the nature of the ownership is, but things like advertising hoardings um, pay rates. Uh, and if they have a, an NAV in the right space and they are owned individually instead of um, as a conglomerate or a group, then they would be entitled. Um, ATM machines, I've already mentioned yeah. them. Telecommunications masks, you might want to ask about car parks, car parking spaces, which are sometimes individually rated and paid. Um, I mean, there's quite a broad range it's a very of. Very expensive one right in the middle of Belfast that belongs to a charity, apparently. Um, At the well, it's not a char <laughs> it might belong to a charity, but I think they, they pay rates on that. Mm. So, the, um, so the, there are lots of things you might want to have a look at. Essentially, everything which earns some kind of income can be charged non-domestic rates. So if, if it's actually a legally ownable entity of some description which generates some kind of return financially, it could be. Yeah, it could be rated. And just one last point, if you'll let me in. I, 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 shall, I that, shall indulge. That there were so many different types of businesses and problems that come in through our offices. And again, I said it to you one, the last time you were here, and I'm just stating it again. Some of your officials went beyond the call of duty yeah. in order to get numbers out, yeah. to, get, to get the, the property addresses, even for them to go through for the four-week scheme that they're through there now. And that was done at breakneck speed. And I think it would be remiss if I let you out here today without saying that to you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Just one final, very small one, Matthew. One and a half, very small ones. Um, <laughs> on just, and this may be a real basic question, just on small business rates relief, and obviously that's not dictated eligibility. Our yeah. Yeah. MLA offices shouldn't be getting yeah. lower paying lower rates bills. And are, are, are there any paying lower rates bills or getting the reliefs that are introduced to the COVID related, re, COVID related reliefs? Um, the um, four month rate holiday yeah. will apply to everybody except public sector yeah. properties. Now, um, I don't think MLA and MP offices classify as public sector properties, so you would have benefited from that. Um, the 12 month holiday, I don't think. No. Is that so? 
that doesn't seem so the we've effectively. No, I need to check that. I mean, I'm. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you, you, you do get the four months. You, get the you four weren't months excluded. Months. You weren't specified to be excluded. Public bodies and utilities. Mm -hmm. in the main. I mean, they should have been really. I mean, it's not. We're not. It's budgeted for in the assembly. The assembly commission had budgeted for it, and it's. Only circular to some extent, anyway, because it ends is, up Although this is revenue, this, this is revenue, Northern Ireland specific revenue. Long, Jim. But would, can we check that just to see if, if okay. with the yeah. volume of it would just be helpful to know? Um, and then the other uh, very brief question I had was around um, instances we've talked about political offices where they're direct beneficiaries. Um, there was also some coverage about where landlords have been beneficiaries, uh, uh, and that happened on a couple of occasions. Are you aware of whether that any money has been repaid by landlords of constituency or political parties? Yes. It has? Yep. And um, returned payments from landlords are eight of those so far in total. It, it returned payments from landlords, that's eight political parties? No, no, eight. not for political parties, it was a total landlord repayments of, landlord the, repayments of the 57. Of total, you, don't, yeah. you don't know whether any of the landlords of political parties have repaid? Um, of the, uh, there's one MP's office um, where the landlord was the rate payer, um, and that has been returned. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Gemma, do you want to come in? Yeah, thanks. Um, can you hear me again? Yeah, we can, Gemma. Thanks, um, Ian, uh, for, for your presentation. Um, can I clarify? I'm going to move on to the current schemes. Um, can I clarify? And sorry for my ignorance, it's just. So many schemes you can understand. Am I right in saying that LPS is administering both Department of Finance and Economy schemes? No, no, we're just doing the localised restrictions support scheme. Um, the Department of the Economy is administering the other one, which is the coronavirus business support scheme. And they're using okay. Invest NI okay. to do that, aren't they? I believe so. So, and, and, so you're doing you're doing it on you're doing it on the behalf for the that one, and Invest and I are doing it on the other one. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, um, in terms of the delay in getting the payment out this time, um, was that down to additional checks? Um, no, in part it's down to the fact this is a, well, could say considerably more complex, a, a great deal more complex scheme. So whereas um, the the previous scheme um, um, was for every business on a certain NAV and the criteria were very simple, um, yeah. this scheme is now for particular types of businesses, not all of which are separately identified in the rating system. In addition, whereas everybody in the first scheme got £10,000, we now have 15 different possible payment amounts for a business, depending uh -huh. on where they are, what size of business they are, and how long they're required to close. 15. 15. Uh -huh. Okay, so as a consequence of that, it's much more difficult. Um, mm -hmm. I can go on now to talk about the um, recent payment scheme if you want, and I'll give you some facts and figures in relation to it. Um, yes, please. Yes, yeah, please. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so as of 1 pm today, we had 11,800 applications received so far. Um, there are 4,241 payments have been issued worth £16.04 million. Pounds. Um, and we've also formally rejected 563 as okay. of today. Okay, so that's. Are they any of the same ones that were rejected last time, or? Well, we have um, put a block on anybody who may have received a payment in error on the 10K scheme from receiving a grant under okay. this one until we resolve those cases. Right. Um, now, just to try to explain some of what's going on here, um, we have 2,000, over 2,000 duplicated applications in that 11,800. Um, so we've got to identify all of those and then see whether they are genuinely duplicated and then separate them out uh, and reject them. You said duplicated because it's the same bank account? Same bank account yeah. or some other linking identifier. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, we, um, we have uh, on the application process on the website, there was a, like a list of the types of businesses which were required to close by the restrictions. So it would have said restaurant, cafe, close contact service, pub, whatever it might be. Yeah. Right the way down, even to things like escape rooms and bowling alleys and ice rinks. Yeah. Um, and then there was a other button for people who might not fall into any one of those categories, and we expected those numbers to be quite small. Um, we've had over three and a half thousand people have clicked the, the other. other bit. Okay, so every single one of them has got to be looked at to find out um, whether they are in fact actually eligible. Um, we've had two and a half thousand people who have applied in respect to properties which do not appear on a non-domestic rating list. Right. 
Um, so they'll need to be looked at. We should only have about 400 to 500 potentially on, in that category for bed and breakfasts who are in domestic property. So as is you can is see... That, sorry, is that also some of the people who would, we, we would know as the excluded because they're, uh, they're desperate for... It's possible that it could be people have put their home address instead of their business address in. Well, it could be driver instructors. Could be, could be those who are entitled then to go to the other scheme. But we've got to work out whether the person has made a mistake and put their home address instead of their business address in, or whether they've entered number 27 instead of number 29, or whether they've, you know, there are a whole string of reasons why they might have put the wrong address in. Is there, is there, I mean, is there a possibility, as you've said, some people okay. have applied for the wrong scheme? Yes. And if they have, yes. and, and that's identified, will that information just be transferred to the other scheme or what will happen in those scenarios? Yeah, we, we're, we're currently looking at that. Um, with rejections, they'll be signposted, but we're looking to see if we can work alongside DFE to try and share that information so that those people don't miss out. It would be really good that th that work yeah. concluded well. That, that scheme closes next week, so we're, we're trying to identify all of those who probably should be signposted to that as quickly as we can. Um, so there's a... There's a, a, a uh, sorry, of, gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen. <laughs> ordering process need to be done here um, um, and we um, have got at the, when I was at one of the previous meetings I talked about the fact we've gone to the councils to get environmental health yeah. information so um, that should cover a large number of these cases because um, even things like barbershops and salons have to register with environmental health um, we have got two and a half thousand applications which don't match any council data now they may actually be eligible Right. Uh, right, so we've got to check them all. I think that we, we could be very harsh about this and just rule out anybody who didn't meet the criteria straight away, but I think there's, um, as well as the error in making payments to people who shouldn't get it, there's also the error of making... People who haven't got, got it. it. Oh, ruling out people who are entitled to it, so we've got to try to make sure that we are as fair as possible all applications. This is why it is a slower process than any of us had hoped it would be. Okay. Uh, and, there is, sorry, Chair, okay, and there is room within that for those who find themselves that have been excluded to come back or try to... Oh, yes, the reconsideration process. Reconsideration. And how long is that open for? Um, well, we, we haven't put a closing date on oh, this that's scheme. Good. That's good. Okay, so um, as soon they'll, they'll be asked to uh, appeal, and if they want to appeal within 14 days of receiving their notification. Okay. But we haven't put an end date to that yet. Okay. Um, Tim, I think what we need to do now is we need to move on to the closed session and cover the other areas that we have, that we have identified. Uh, with your agreement, I am going to take the session in, into a uh, confidential setting. Uh, sorry, I'll, just before they do that, uh, one of the things we came out of that meeting was I would like the committee to consider further the process which permits business such as renewable energy generators to avail of the small business rates relief. I so propose. Great. 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 Thank you very much. Um, if, it, if it helps the committee chair, um, uh, Alan Bronte and myself can come back at some point and talk through the policy issues around the small business rates relief in advance yes. of the renewal. Yes, please. Year. I think we would be delighted to have yeah. that. Okay. Okay. Now we're just going to move into close Alan's session. Alan's probably watching this and he's cursing me at this point. Assembly, <laughs> <laughs> Senate Chamber, programme signed. Uh, Ian, uh, th thank you very much indeed for your evidence so far. One of the issues from the committee, uh, obviously, is some of the concerns we have about sort of staffing levels, and we have seen the report from the Northern Ireland Audit Office and the shortages of staff within the Northern Ireland Civil Service. And I noticed from one of the notes we have that there is uh, over sort of 95 vacancies in LPS at the administrator's office level. Is that creating you difficulties? And indeed, do you believe that the voluntary exit scheme, when it came through, has further exacerbated the problems that you've had? Um, yes, at the administrative officer grade alone, there are over 90 vacancies. Um, in total, we have 146 vacant posts at the minute. Um, our head count should be 1,114. Um, currently, um, we have 13% of those posts are vacant, um, 130 or 11.5% are filled by agency staff, and most of those would be at the administrative officer grade. Uh, and we've got 34 temporary promotions covering various posts. So at this point in time, um, of our staffing headcount, only 72% of the posts are filled by a permanent member of staff in the correct grade. So on the voluntary exit scheme, yes, it did have significant impact on, um, on LPS, um, and um, we lost quite a large number of uh, experienced staff at, at that point. Um, now, we are able to... 
um, recruit our own professional staff on the Ordnance Survey and the Evaluation Divisions, but for administrative and ICT staff, then we rely on the Civil Service General processes in order to, to fill vacancies, and um, we, we are having difficulties getting some of those posts filled. It wouldn't be fair of me to ask what your consideration of the report is to the Auditor General, but I'm going to ask it anyhow. Um, the issue particularly with recruiting suitably trained and qualified staff and the fact that the recruitment process within the Northern Ireland Civil Service doesn't seem to be able to deliver what we need. Uh, do you think there needs to be a transformation of the recruitment service to be able to make sure that your organisation is appropriately and as a chief executive is appropriately manned and capable? Um, well, one of the things that we have found very frustrating over this past period of time is the inability to get staff at that administrative officer grade, where we're very heavily dependent on LPS um, for both the rate collection system, uh, rate rebate and housing benefit administration and the land registry. Um, so it has been a, like a, a major frustration. I've been in post for two years and two months just over now. Um, I think one of the very first meetings I had was a discussion about how we were going to recruit um, uh, administrative officer grade staff into those kinds of jobs. We have customer facing roles which have a particular skill set. You know, maybe that might be on the phones or meeting people face to face. Um, and there was a proposal to have a particular type of recruitment to bring those sort of staff in. It's only now that we're actually starting to see any possibility that people might come in. So it has been a, a quite a slow process. Okay, thank you very much, Matthew. Um, that's a shocking number. So more than only less than three quarters of your staff are mm -hmm. permanent are permanent LPS staff. Yes. Less than three. Is there ever been a comparable? Um, has that ever been? Uh, the case in the past, are you anywhere close to historic average? Um, I w I'm, I'm, I'm setting myself up to be identified as failing in this point. Whenever I came into the post, the, the number was 78 per cent, and now it's 72. Um, and it's been because we haven't been able to get, um, haven't been able to get staff in at that administrative grade on, on a permanent basis. Um, so we, we're very heavily reliant on agency and temporary staff across large parts of the organisation. What, what's the key? Uh, you talked about it. What's the key, one key reason why it's difficult to get people? Um, there was a there wasn't a kind of an embargo on recruitment for for quite a long time because of the um, because of the financial constraints. Um, so um, that's why we've become so heavily dependent on the on the agency workers. Normally, you would expect those posts to have been filled by by permanent members of staff, and some of those agency staff have been with us just what four years more. Yeah. I was going to ask the question of what's the turnover like in agency staff, but if you've got them there for four years, mm -hmm. I mean, how does that leave you legally if they've been there for that length of time? They must be getting fairly close to. They are, under the terms of the contract the civil service has to bring agency staff in, they are the employees of the agency and they aren't ours, so there's no transfer of obligation. But they, I mean, <clears throat> I presume you're effectively paying a premium in order to. Um, there's only pennies of difference per hour. And pay, um, so it's not actually that much more expensive. Well, except the monies to the agency. Uh, well, they, they obviously are taking a profit, but then we don't have other considerations like pensions, for example. The, what's what's the staff are getting paid less than they would be if they were permanent staff? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, um, there, there are differences in the um, total amount of um, of employment cost for a member of staff who's a permanent civil servant will include things like pension, pensions and all national insurance contributions. Yeah. Um, so, if you take what it costs to employ a member of staff, they may be getting the same amount of money to do the same job, but they're not getting uh, paid. But, but, they, but they get pensions pensions. and other benefits. But you're in, but you're in a slightly crazy situation where recruitment freezes uh, subsequent to the um, voluntary exit uh, scheme have meant that there is a there has been an not a civil service wide recruitment freeze, but a um, a chill on recruitment. Mm -hmm. Um, which has meant that you have become yeah. disproportionately yeah. reliant on um, agency staff. Oh, yes. Um, not the only part of the civil service no. in that position. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know, um, is there a, so you've mentioned the, the administrative officer grade is where the particular challenge is. Are there any areas of business activity that have been uh, specifically detrimentally affected by the inability to... Um, to get more permanent staff? Um, the, there is a particular shortage in ICT grade staff. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we have quite a few vacancies in, in that team, in our digital services and support team. 
Um, we, um, in terms of performance, um, we've managed to hold the performance up quite well, but we're very heavily reliant on things like overtime in order to achieve that. Um, it's also partly a contributor towards surpluses generated in land registry in the sense that there are a lot of vacant posts, so there's no money being spent employing the staff on the consequence then the surplus is larger than it would be otherwise if all the posts were filled. In the valuation directorate, um, where we have to manage the business as usual activity as well as things like the revaluation, there was a definite deterioration in the business as usual performance because staff had to be moved across to um, the revaluation activity in order to try to achieve that particular target, which was the priority. And only whenever that work was finished, we were able to bring them back in to try and deal with the, the work stocks that had built up as a consequence of that. So, yes, it's, it's like firefighting quite a lot of the time. Okay. Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, Ian and Judith, thank you very much indeed for your evidence, and thank you very much indeed for coming in and speaking to us, and thank you indeed for being as open as you have. Okay. And I think on behalf of the committee, we thank you very much indeed. And if you'd also pass on to Christine as well, our thanks. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Okay, Tim, if we move on to the next item on the agenda, Department of Finance's superannuation and other alliances pension scheme statement for the year ended 31st of March. The relevant papers for the Department of Finance's and alliances pension scheme statements on page 35. Members, do we have any comments? Are we content to note. Noted. Uh, move into Westminster Hansard Report, International Trade Committee Oral Evidence, UK Free Ports. Hansard Report is on page uh, 101. Members, do we have any comments? Uh, there is something I would like to, uh, when we're looking at the sort of the reports on free ports as well. Uh, from the historical record, Northern Ireland has had free ports in the past, including Belfast International Airport. And we haven't actually seen much economic benefit from them. We've seen quite a lot of discussion ongoing, particularly on Teesside, Liverpool, and other areas are looking at free ports and the opportunity for free ports. One of the things I would like us to do is to investigate in free ports. How does that leave us with reference to the protocol? Because we're in an interesting situation where we would be applying for free port status under the United Kingdom. That would apply to uh, customs regulations, that would apply for trade, that would apply for various other forms of regulation within the Freeport area. However, the question is, as is always the case in this case, uh, who has primacy? Will it be the protocol or will it be the role and rule of the United Kingdom? And I think I would probably like some research on that. And I would like to see if we are going to have UK, or if we are going to have Freeport status in Northern Ireland, exactly under which jurisdiction does it work, and how would it likely to be run? I think that would probably initially be a either a question for raise or a question to be uh, go directly to the ministers of the economy and finance. Uh, sorry, Chair, I, just, I think I mean th that's an idea. The Freeport granting Northern Ireland Freeport. There's a there's a Freeport's consultation, obviously. I think run yep. by. Either debt or bays, one of the two. Yeah, bays. Yeah. Bays, and but it's not it hasn't been guaranteed or confirmed that that's going no. to happen. Uh, but one of the questions we need to ask ourselves is if it is going to happen, what's the implications of it? Is there anything in the consultation on that issue? No. I think there was a line. I think there has been some government line saying this would, you know, that it, it would. Not ruling it out as a possibility, but saying it would have to be ma it's cons it would be managed in line with the protocol or something. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it is complicated. I'm not saying we shouldn't yeah. look into it. No, it's, it ties in. I mean, we, earlier on we were asking the question about VAT regimes and differential VAT, VAT regimes and the implication on PPA and the implication on cars and various other issues. We asked that question right at the beginning. I mm -hmm. think this is an area of work that the committee is going to have to become increasingly involved in uh, next year when the protocol hits. I mean, there is an argument that Northern Ireland is, if it, there's lots of people are very sceptical about the idea of, product of, of free ports in general, really, yeah. Northern Ireland or not. There is an argument that Northern Ireland is in a better, actually, because of the protocol, Northern Ireland is in a more, is in a sort of more natural position to take advantage of free ports because it will have partial membership of the EU single market. So it's certainly was something to be discussed, but needs robust research okay. to look okay. at the. Uh, maybe you should ask Reyes to have a. Maybe we'll ask Reyes to have a look at that. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Move on to the next uh, item on the agenda was the Minister's statement on the EU programmes, which was tabled at page 9. Uh, we have heard the statement. We all had the opportunity in the Assembly to respond. Uh, any comments? 
Happy to note. Noted. Uh, moving on to item number 10, correspondence. Response from NISRA regarding the annual report and accounts. Uh, advise from members when its response, NISRA has highlighted a number of matters relating to unnecessary restrictions, interesting use of words, unnecessary restrictions replaced on the agency relating to the recruitment of staff, bearing in mind the evidence we have just had from the head of LPS. Advised members, on a wider note, NISRA considers that the attributed red, amber, green status for the underspend was justifiable because measurable progress had been made against the target but was less than anticipated due to events beyond the agency's control. That is an interesting colour scheme for that one. And NISRA's target for underspend was 1.5 per cent. However, for the year 2019-20, the actual underspend was 2.2 per cent and therefore it was considered not being met. But the question within the underspend and the question about unnecessary restrictions being placed in the agency relating on recruitment staff, there are some questions there. If they are looking particularly for staff and they have an underspend, why can't they spend it on staff? And I think there are a couple of issues there that have uh, been raised by NISRA to the Northern Ireland uh, Civil Service Human Resources Team for a response to the relevant issues highlighted. So I think we should ask the Department for an assessment on how the various status of guidance can be strengthened to provide a clear and unambiguous differentiation between their sort of their colour status as well and their issues to do with staffing. If we are content, content. I seek your agreement for the remaining items of correspondence. Uh, note the information request to the department routine paper circulated on Friday, the 11th of 2020. Uh, move on to the forward work programme. Four members and updated forward work programme is at page 169. Uh, seek agreement to contempt with the forward work programme for September December 2020. Uh, members, do we have any other items of business? Uh, the next meeting will be on Wednesday, uh, 25th of November at 1400 here. Thank you very much indeed, and I hereby adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.